What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. Today, we are going to be covering a very, very interesting haunted island, Ovalia. Many of the island's current ghosts began appearing after the Black Death that terrorized Europe in the 14th century. It's believed that the fleas and lice actually carried the disease at first, but then it passed on to smaller creatures like rats. It's believed that in 1630s alone, 55,000 Venetians died on the island, but they also ordered the corpses to be burned. Apparently, the local government converted the old plague hospital into an asylum, and it's believed that one sadistic doctor named Paolo always carried out the most radical experiments. According to legend, many patients here describe seeing strange shadow creatures lurking in the isolated rooms. You were lucky if you survived more than a week. Light out, everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out out i'm your host josh in the studio i'm joined by my co-host austin hey what up man what to do man <laughs> we got our producer daniel what's up guys we are back after a week off thank you guys for hanging on tight you know sometimes we just got to take a little break refresh and we are back for a while now not another break till the very end of the year so very exciting and today we have some very special news to share with you we are officially launching our lights out low life slash fan club which i'm not totally set on low lives so i think i went with that so people understand i you know there's meaning behind it right we're lights out we cover a lot of low life individuals yeah some of the worst so i thought you know it's kind of a play on that so and like myself i am a low right well so, i was yeah you were in mind when I came up with that. So I was like, you know, it's just like kind of, kind of catchy, right? It's LOL. Ha ha yeah, ha. Yeah. It's pretty funny. So what is Lights Out Low Lives? Well, it is our membership via YouTube, which is very cool because you can subscribe, become a member. It's, it's a paid thing. It's a way to support the show. All the money earned through that goes right back into the show. It helps me put food in these guys' bellies, right? I need it. He, yeah, he eats a lot of food. So I got to make sure to keep him fed, keep Daniel happy over there. So, you know, all of that support that we get through the membership does go back into the show, does help us produce more content for you guys. Because one of the things that we're trying to do is actually come out with some different perks for you via this new Lights Out Low Life fan club that we're running through YouTube. So not only will you be supporting the show just monetarily, but you'll get some really cool perks along with it. One of the cool things that you get is 24 hour access to the episode before everybody else does and it's ad free. So that will be available to you on Thursday around noon Mountain Standard Time. You'll be able to watch the episode before anybody else does, which is very cool. Also, when you sign up, there'll be loyalty badges. So basically your name on YouTube, if you've ever left a comment, you'll get a little badge next to your name, which will signify that you are a Lights Out Low Life and absolutely love the badges that we came up with. There are a bunch of different skeletons, skulls, with uh, different looks to them, which I think is very cool. And that changes based on how long you are a member for. So you get the new member loyalty badge, then one month, two month, six months, one year, two years. So we'll see who the real loyal fans are, okay? If you can make it to four years, yes, I will write you a personalized handwritten letter. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. A love letter. Well, I'd be, I'd be careful want, with <laughs> that, but... You profess your love in, in a different way. Yeah. But not only that, you get custom emojis for members, which is really cool. Um, we've got a bunch of different ones. We've got one of Austin, of course. Um, I'll have Daniel put a few of them up on the screen so you can see them. But we're also going to be doing a member-only Discord server. So when you become a member, you'll have access to this private Discord server with us. We'll be the only other people a part of it other than you guys. It'll be a great place for you to connect with other Lights Out Low Lives plus us and discuss the episodes, all that kind of thing. Not only that, we're planning on doing at least one live stream every month or so, which will just be a casual sort of hangout with us, ask us questions, you know, tell us a joke, or Austin will, will tell you a joke. 
This jokes are really bad. Just just yeah, a heads up. Don't I have hundreds. Keep the expectations low yes. when it comes to jokes from Austin. But that'll be a good time. We'll we'll have a schedule for those here soon. But also you get 24 hour early merch access as well and a monthly discount code for members only to our new Lights Out merch collections, which will be coming here soon, plus a private case request form. So if you want to request a story, a case, the form will be only for members. So the public one we've had will be going away and only members will be able to actually suggest a topic for us to cover, which and will be I, really cool. I know you guys have really good ideas out there. Yes, yeah. we've. We've been inspired by a lot of the suggestions. Tons. Yeah. Tons. I mean, the paranormal realm is where we'd really love some some help and suggestions because we've burned through almost all the Warren files the that we could possibly do. Yeah. So it'd be nice to get into some more um, unique ones that are out there because, you know, there's endless supply of them. It's just sometimes hard to find them. Right now, that is all the perks that we're offering for members. Another thing we've been considering, too, is potentially doing bonus content into the future when we have time to work it into our schedule. We were talking about doing potentially like a horror movie review i'd be so down for some movie that'd be reviews. really really cool which you know none two's coming out in september so maybe that'll be our first members only movie review which will be uh, available via youtube so yeah membership is a great way to support the channel it really helps us out really helps us continue to elevate the show the content and it allows us to give you guys some really cool perks that is exclusive to lights out low lives only so again, if you're on YouTube, on your phone or computer, there will be a little join button. This is live as of this episode going up today. So if maybe you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and you're interested in checking out what this club is all about, just head over to YouTube and you'll see a little join button. You just click that, sign up, and then you'll instantly gain access to all those perks that I mentioned. So check it out. We really appreciate it. You know, there's no expectations with it or anything like that. The content will still be exactly the same for everybody else we're not putting everything behind a paywall episodes will still go up on fridays normal time on youtube this is just a way for you know those of you who want more lights out to get that via the youtube membership so enough of that but today we are going to be covering a very very interesting haunted island that is poveglia uh, poveglia like it looks spelled yeah. i'm, I'm going to really struggle with that i know but this is an island off the coast of what Venice. It's like yep, it's right off just of Venice. south of Venice. Yep, and man, the history of this place is 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 bone chilling. Yes. Honestly, literally, the island is made up of human ash, and that right there tells you there's bound to be endless amounts of paranormal activity. So we are covering the plague island that is Povelia today. But this episode of Lights Out is brought to you by Manscaped, Rocket Money, and HelloFresh. So with that being said, let's just go ahead and dive into the very dark history of Povelia. So the small island of Povelia sits in Italy's Venetian Lagoon. It floats about three miles south of Venice, like Austin mentioned, and it's divided by a small canal. The centerpiece is the old church bell tower with a tan roof and boarded up windows that can be seen from the water. Napoleon ordered the 12th century church to be demolished around 200 years ago, but its tower is still the tallest point on the island. Now its holy cross towers above, swarming with evil paranormal energy. For many tourists, Povelia Island is a quiet mass of land lost to time, but a deeper look into the island reveals its horrific past. If you ask the locals in Venice, they'll tell you it's one of the most haunted places in Europe. And it's literally gotten the nickname, the Island of No Return. The earliest recorded history of people living on the island dates back to 421 CE. People were forced to flee from Este and Paduya when the Huns invaded. At the time, there wasn't a trace of paranormal activity on the island, but the people who fled there were living a real life horror. At first, the Huns were nomadic people, but later they formed one of the strongest empires the world had ever seen. Their leader, Attila, the Hun, waged battles on the Roman Empire. Thank God these guys were ruthless. They hunted down anyone in sight, including women and children, and just brutally killed them. They would loot and plunder each town they conquered, 
and they rarely left anyone alive. If they ever did spare someone, they enslaved them. Many living in Italy at the time fled to Bavalia because it was small, safe, and not far from the coast. And it ended up being a smart move since all their hometowns were later burned to the ground. When they reached the island, it was mostly untouched. The island itself was only about 17 acres, which is about nine football fields. It was covered in trees and shrubs. Since it was small and surrounded by water, it was easier to defend against the Huns as they tried to cross the waters and invade. Because the Huns, I mean, they were, you know, powerful soldiers and, you know, beastly warriors, but they really were powerful because they rode on horseback. And obviously, horses swimming through water is, you know, not easy by any means. So it definitely made it more difficult for them to get to the island. As time went on, the refugees on the island thrived. And through the centuries, they had isolated themselves from the rest of Italy. In the ninth century, the Italian government began to take notice of the successful island. So they officially gave the island a podesta, which is similar to a mayor. The island was then officially represented by the local government. Centuries passed and the island continued its success. But in 1379, Venice was attacked by the Genoese. So the local government decided to remove everyone from Pavalia so they could use it as a defensive position. After they defended against the fleet of Genoese ships, the military abandoned the island. And literally for years, no one returned until they found a new, more horrific use for it. Many of the island's current ghosts began appearing after the Black Death that terrorized Europe in the 14th century. In October 1374, 12 ships docked at a Sicilian port. Dock workers first noticed that some of the ships were filled with dead bodies, and the sailors that were still alive were sprawled across the deck covered in black boils that dripped blood and puss. Sicilian authorities tried to act as fast as possible because obviously they're like, oh shit, this is not good. Not knowing what had happened to the men, they're like, yeah, take these guys get and get as here. far away from here as possible because they knew that whatever it was spelled disaster. But it was already too late. The plague had hit Europe and spread like wildfire. And it would later be known as one of the greatest disasters in all of human history. Black Death, man. Scary. Super brutal, too. And lasted way longer than I thought. I will do my best. I'm going to try and give you guys a crash course on the Black Death. It's, it's a can of worms, so I'll just sum it up the best i can without getting Which too we deep into have it. an episode on the black death was, yeah, yeah from, it's a while it. ago when we covered uh, plague doctors and yep. uh, great detail but so i'll do my best just to sum it up just to give you context of what's going on here especially with the island of pavalia so by the time the plague had reached italy it had actually already swept through china india persia and syria long before this was just another wave of it, and it usually followed trade routes, so they had to be very careful about their trade routes. Which makes sense, right? Like, Yeah. Large numbers of people moving between countries bring the Black Death with exactly. them. Exactly, and usually the port cities are main cities, so it's once it hits a main city, it's just spreading like wildfire. Like we saw with the you know last pandemic we had. Exactly. Airplanes, I mean, you know, yep. it's very hard to like, quarantine you know areas where there's people coming in from every which way of the world and, exactly and so back then obviously it was trade routes yep makes sense it's believed that the fleas and lice actually carried the disease at first but then it passed on to smaller creatures like rats and uh, uh, rats are kind of known to be the the that's the poster Damn rats, child man. yeah they're, they're always <laughs> spreading shit that's the poster child of the black death and for good reason, because rats were known to sneak onto ships. And so if a rat had it snuck on a ship, found its way to the next city, that was a great and terrible way to Which I'm transmit sure rats carry fleas too, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And then lice and stuff. I mean, I'd see no reason why they wouldn't. Makes sense. So then once it passed to human, it would obviously, it could pass from person to person. So super disgusting. These large blackish blue growths would begin to swell and sometimes they Get up to the size of an egg. Oh my god! Which Can you imagine that? <laughs> so of an disgusting. Egg-sized lump, and they were blackish and blue too. You oh. would like clearly something was so wrong yeah, at like, that point. And the worst part is that they were mostly in your groin and armpit. What? Yeah. Oh, dude. So imagine just how uncomfortable that would be. Just walking around with those. Yeah. Funny enough, my roommate, my old roommate Lloyd, 
he had a boobo in his armpit a one boobo? summer. Yeah, that's, that's what they're called. It's that's like the like bump a, you get off of. It's it's like your lymph node or something. Oh, like, like that. a inflamed lymph node or something. Yeah. So he had one in his armpit. I didn't. I've I had never seen one in real life up until then. I was like, oh god, that's gnarly, I man. Have, I he got. I think he got. It was COVID and the Bubo at the same time. And we were like, is this really is happening? Really connected? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Well, we weren't sure if it was connected. Or I just wonder if it's because like the crease is like yeah. a perfect environment for those nodules to grow. Like, yeah, maybe. Because it's yeah, weird that it's like in areas specifically, right? Where yeah. your skin's kind of like creased yeah, in and like against other and skin and sweaty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, I can't even imagine. Like, yeah, no, thank you. Oh, sometimes rare occasions they would get as big as an apple i just can't even imagine having an apple sized lump in your armpit or groin and on top of this they would leak bodily fluids if that wasn't you know fun enough so i'm sure people tried to like cut those off of them and, oh like, i'm sure people did all sorts of crazy I stuff to get rid of them imagine like knowing medical science back then they probably just were guessing at half the shit and just keep cutting them off oh, oh jesus <laughs> That's brutal, man. Yeah. So uh, not only that, but you also had fever, pain, chills, and almost always the inevitable death. That is a really terrible way to go, man. And these numbers are insane. The plague killed somewhere around 100 to 150 million people worldwide. That's the estimate. Obviously, it's harder to track that back then, but I can't even imagine that. And it's it's the most fatal pandemic in, in history in the world. It had three waves between 542 CE and 1894 CE. So this lasted, you know, they talked about the pandemic waves, right? Coming in and out. It's like, well, here's the second wave, third wave. But really in, in the grand scheme of things, these waves of a pandemic can last, especially back then when, it, when things weren't globalized they could just keep coming back in different areas across the world with a vengeance. So this, I believe the, when it hit Italy, the worst, it was the second wave, I want to say. And it killed between 25 and 50 million people in Europe, which was somewhere between 30 to 60% of its population, which I can't even wrap my mind around. In places like Florence, it was even worse. Florence was about 160 miles from Venice. And it killed up to 90% of the population there. Imagine just waking up one day and like everyone's gone. So many people had died that they couldn't even bury the bodies. That's wild. Yeah. There the were people that were burying the bodies were in essence, burying themselves at the same time. They're true. Very wow. true. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like, cause obviously you're like, well, how did it get that bad? And I think, as far as what we know, I mean, we don't know exactly how all this unfolded, but it seems like it became um, airborne to some extent. Like, like you can pass it via just like breathing on somebody, or you know, breathing, uh, breathing the same air. And yeah, and we'll we'll um, we'll talk about the Venetian those masks too right, that became right. famous because it plays into that where they were kind of. Now we understand it a lot better, but they were kind of on the right track even back then with how they were contact getting into contact with it and how it was actually in they're figuring them. it out yeah slowly <laughs> too late. but not yeah good god and at the time or only around 0.2 percent of europe had immunity which is crazy to think about yeah and the medical experiments that we were talking about how they didn't really understand what was going on the people that were still alive they were treated with bloodletting which is you know they just like drain your blood thinking yeah. it was like bad blood or something yeah sometimes you'll see people do it with leeches that's kind of like the iconic right. way uh, right. they were bathing in vinegar and they were pushing red hot knives into their boils to drain the fluids like that would help which i think medical science has proven that's like a terrible thing to do terrible like, that's the opposite of what you want to do to stab boils. yourself yeah talk about infection right spreading honestly. getting worse some doctors even stopped accepting patients after a while because they realized they're like we have failed we don't know how to cure this so just stay at home and stay away from me die in peace at your house <laughs> yeah honestly that's what they were telling people jeez even priests started refusing last rites, which is pretty, I mean, that's to think about that where last rites, especially at a time like this in Italy was like, meant everything to people. Yeah. You know, that's, that was your last send off hoping that you'd go into heaven. And the priest was like, 
I'm sorry. You're on I your own, risk kid. This. Yeah. yeah. Some who caught it were asymptomatic, which obviously, you know, we would learn a lot about that with COVID. Um, and they were asymptomatic for a few days, possibly transmitting it to other people. So it was hard to quarantine people. But the Italian authorities tried their best to mitigate the damage. So Pavalia Island became their third quarantine island. And fun fact, the word quarantine actually stems from this time period. I don't know if we covered this back in the old episode, but... So at first, the Italian government be began isolating these ships for about 30 days, and they realized that might have not been enough time, so they bumped it up to 40 days. Because they're like, oh yeah, 10 days, that should make a difference, right? Yeah, right, yeah, honestly. And so the word for it was Quaranta Giorni in Venetian, and it, it roughly translates to 40 days. And oh. so that Quaranta is where we get the word we quarantine. We derive the word quarantine, yeah. oh. So I never knew that. Yeah, very interesting. So there's your, uh, I hope everyone was taking notes. There's a big yeah. exam at the end of yeah. this episode. Pop about, quiz, people. Yeah. Well, if you want to know more about, um, you know, the Black Death, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about Plague Doctors later on, but yeah. we have a whole episode that dives into it in, in pretty extensive detail. So we'll, uh, you know, maybe throw a card up there on YouTube if you're watching for a link. Uh, so if you want to go watch that after, uh, very, very interesting. But yeah, beware, it's very brutal. Thank you to Rocket Money for being a sponsor of today's episode. Rocket Money is an absolutely amazing app that I use every single day, and here's why. It seems like every product or service you use these days requires a subscription. I have so many subscriptions, I can't even tell you. I probably have 20 plus subscriptions, and there were so many that I wasn't actually even using anymore. For example, there's a new show that drops on HBO Max, and of course you've got to start the trial, then I forget, and the subscription just gets charged every month. I go and watch the show, and then I abandon the app and never use it again. Meanwhile, I'm being charged. Rocket Money makes it super easy to identify all of your expenses, not only subscriptions. My favorite thing about Rocket Money is that they make canceling those unwanted subscriptions as easy as a click of the button. Rocket Money is so much more than just managing your expenses. You can track your credit, track all of your transactions via your debit card, credit cards, whatever accounts you want to attach to it. It monitors all of that for you. It's really the all-in-one finance app that is one that I go to absolutely every single day. And it has saved me money. And it's also helped me manage my money more efficiently. I absolutely love Rocket Money. And if you're not using Rocket Money, go and download it right now. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the freaking easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash lights out. That's rocketmoney.com slash lights out. Check it out today. Rocketmoney.com slash lights out. So the Venetian government began isolating people on the nearby islands. There were so many cases of the plague that they opened Pavalia as the third quarantine island. Ships were ordered to stop at the island before they were allowed to dock at Venice. And if they showed any signs of the plague, they were ordered to anchor their ship off the coast for 40 days. So, man, that's that's crazy too. Just sitting out on a ship for 40, 40 days, days quarantining. like, And as you can imagine, many of them died while anchored. And their ships had to be recovered while the infected bodies were still on board. So everybody just dies on the ship. And then there's just this ship out there with a bunch of dead people on it. At the time, Venice was one of the biggest trading ports. So as the Black Death went on for centuries, this island became a quarantine station for anyone that even slightly suspected of having the plague. Children from Venice were taken from their families. Can you imagine that? Never to be seen again. Those shipped to the island hoped to return to their families after 40 days, but most, if not all, ended up dying there. That's what's crazy too, is like somebody probably knew that they were sending these people to their death. Yep. And they're like, oh, well, you know, quarantine islands becoming just a graveyard over yeah. there and i think they just knew that was reality at that point where it was like you might get lucky you might come home but but who's going back over there to bring you back right it's not like there's like a you know it's not like you're seeing ship come back from the island day after day with people oh i'm cured you know i'm good to go back yeah. back to no you're just going to your death that's that's terrifying i mean especially kids like having your kid taken from you because it like that to me is just terrifying and God, I hope that never happens again. Because if you went over there, you were lucky if you survived more than a week. Even most of the medical staff that was sent over there to try and treat the sick also caught the plague. 
and they became terminal patients one after the next. So here's where the Venetian plague masks come into play. It was in 17th century Italy. So this had been going on for centuries by now. Um, you've probably seen these masks in movies, carnivals, video games. I think one of the Assassin's Creed games like really brought into the forefront and made it iconic. But it looks like it's a mask with like a bird's head and, yeah. and a beak. And on the sides of the beak were these two slits where air could pass through. The face was mostly covered except the eyes where they had these holes that were sealed with glass. They also wore a long outer garment that wrapped tightly around the mask. It, think of it like a hazmat suit kind of. And they sometimes wore a hat with a large brim and a flat top. Occasionally you'll see, I think they have some of the depictions, they have wands. But I think that's more of just a stylistic interpretation of it. It really had no practical use as far as I could see. And there's a reason it's it's so creepy, actually. I'll get to that in a second. Would it be messed up to be that for Halloween? <laughs> Is it too soon? <laughs> is it too soon yeah too soon. i mean it's like you said it's it's all over in media and carnivals video games like i know in uh the recent uh world of warcraft expansion there's actually a, a armor set that's oh, really? modeled there's a light armor set that's modeled after the plague it's nice. one of my favorites it's really cool that's awesome it's a very iconic look it is so the theory behind this getup is that they were trying to protect themselves from the plague or what they called miasma at the time, they thought one of the main reasons, like you were talking about, they were kind of on track. They called it bad air. So they were kind of, they had the right idea, but they weren't sure. It's not, it wasn't clear if it was like, is it coming from you or is it coming from like just something? Everywhere, yeah. right. They don't know the origin of it. Right. Um, so the beaks and the masks, they filled with these strong smelling herbs and spices that were supposed to protect them from this quote unquote bad air. And the most common concoction was called Theriac. It was a compound of 55 different herbs. So, man, imagine just 55, 55 herbs. 55 herbs, like right by your nose. Dude, too. That, these guys must have been like tripping, <laughs> right? Like, can you imagine any combo of 55 herbs has got to be pretty, pretty strong. And, yeah. and that's probably the point. They're like, the stronger it is, is the more, the better the it's filtering the air. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was the idea. So the, yeah, like the beak size was believed to give enough room for the air too to be saturated by the herbs before it could reach their mouth or nose. But then, so you're like, okay, that kind of makes a practical sense, but why does it look like this terrifying bird? It's because even though they were men of science, it, they also believed that the plague could have been caused by spirits. So like this bad air could have been some sort of like evil energy yeah. from evil spirits that were in the air so the idea was that this mask acted as a way to frighten off the spirits smart yeah, smart I mean, honestly you know I'm at sure. a certain point they were probably like we are desperate to try and figure this shit <laughs> like, out we can't figure it out so this has got to be something supernatural yeah, at this point. it's been hundreds of years so i don't blame them yeah i mean it, it makes a lot of sense honestly when you think about it but not not quite as uh, efficient in its purpose as they would have liked it to be i can just i'm thinking of the people that are on their deathbed they're they're suffering from the black death and then all of a sudden this man wearing this get up comes over you as you're already probably delusional and like passing passing away high fever or something this yeah. guy in this plague mask is standing over you i'm like it's the grim reaper that's the Come last thing you me. see before you know you take your final breath and you're staring into the eyes of this terrifying mask like oh god just all around a terrifying time to be alive, I would assume. So hard. Yeah, but it's so easy these days. <laughs> so <laughs> much like, We have nothing to complain about, nice let's be honest. air-conditioned studio right now yeah. with my coffee beans that probably come from Relatively clean air. Well, you know, yeah. a little incense burning, but for yeah. the most part, we're there could be demonic entities swarming around us. We don't know. But True, especially in here. You never know. But as the plague swept through Italy, the island's buildings became so crowded that in some rooms, three or four patients were assigned, not just the room, to one hospital bed. What? But it, how does that work? It's like good luck just laying down. on top of each just other. Just going to sit there and like lean sardines? against each other. Yeah, it's just like, like shoulder to shoulder leaning against each other. Lord. From the 1300s onward, the Black Death hit Venice in waves. It's believed that in 1630s alone, 55,000 Venetians died on the island. Not only did officials send them there to die, 
but they also ordered the corpses to be burned in order to stop the spread of the disease. Even some of the bodies from Venice were shipped over to Pavalia and burned. Massive Navy barges would haul over bodies by the hundreds, and from sunup to sundown, workers would dump bodies into pits. What's even more horrifying is that some of those victims were not even dead yet. That's just beyond comprehension. But they were too sick to move or talk. So they're like, well, close to death anyway, throw them in. And then they would light the pits on fire. When they were done burning, they scattered the ashes across Pavilia. And today it's believed that human ash makes up more than 50% of the island's topsoil. Let that sink in for a moment. Trees, honeysuckle, and blackberry bushes now grow out of the mounds of soil mixed with human ash. And if you dig a random hole anywhere on the island, you might come across scattered bones. This is much different than the other quarantine islands around Venice. The others had mass graves where they buried bodies whole. And with each new wave, they reopened these graves to layer more and more bodies on top. But here on Pavalia, the only way they could deal with the thousands of bodies was to cremate them and scatter the ash. Now, the island is literally the remains of the dead, and many believe countless spirits haunt the grounds and the buildings, and the sheer amount of tragedy in one small area makes Pavilia a supernatural hotspot. For years, the Italian government kept up the temporary confinement for the ill, or what they called Lazaretto, on the island until 1805. Napoleon Bonaparte made it permanent lodging for the sick to die there, but it was closed in 1814. At the time, the locals nicknamed it the Island of Ghosts. Operations on the island were shut down and closed off to the public in the early 1800s. It's believed that over the centuries, 160,000 people were sent to this island over the years. Countless more were buried and burned here. As the island sat vacant, a surge in paranormal activities began. From Pavalia to Venice, unexplained phenomena traveled across three miles of lagoon water. By 1904, the island had been abandoned for decades, and on a cool November night, a thick, low-hanging fog floated across the lagoon from Pavalia to the shores of Venice. It then slowly crept into the canals. A captain of a public water bus set off from Burano to take a group of night shift workers home. The fog grew thicker by the minute, making it near impossible to travel the canals. Around the same time, a small boat of passengers was setting off from a small pier. They were both coming from Murano, a small island to the north. They saw the captain's boat across the dark waters and decided to give him a head start into the fog so that they wouldn't crash into each other. Well, guess what happened? As the captain got deeper into the fog, he realized visibility was far too low and there was no way he would make it back to the dock safely. So he decided to turn back. But what he didn't realize is that two passenger gondolas were not far behind him. After he turned the boat and retreated, he crashed into the small passenger boat, splitting one completely in half. The passengers were sent into the dark waters, and the workers on board the captain's boat scrambled to try to save as many as possible. They pulled four aboard, but the five other passengers, all women, vanished into the foggy waters. The following morning, the fog had lifted. Two bodies were found floating in the water. One woman, Maria Tosobulo, was found clinging to a wooden post and had survived the night in the freezing waters. But sadly, she died only a few minutes later after she was rescued. Two of the women from the crash were still missing, Teresa Sandin and a little girl named Giuseppina Gabriel Carmelo. About a year passed with no sign of them, but in September of 1905, Teresa's sister had a vision. In a deep dream, she saw Teresa come to her in the night, and she explained that her body had been tethered to the bottom of a canal. She needed to pray for her so she could finally be released. Teresa's sister did as she was told. And a week and a half later, a dark and bloated body floated to the surface of the Bisaw Canal. Her sister identified Teresa by her unique scarf, which still hung to her neck. At that point, four of the five victims had been found, which meant that the young girl Giuseppina was the last, but her body was lost to the lagoon forever. Years passed and her family had to accept her fate. And according to legend, on foggy nights, some have seen four floating lights out in the lagoon or in the canals. If the light gets close enough to you, you'll see there are bright wax candles attached to four corners of a small wooden casket. If you witness this casket, you have been visited by the ghost of young Giuseppina. And today, many fishermen refuse to fish in the Venetian lagoon, especially near Pavalia. 
During the plague, the island was also used for executing criminals. Many were killed by drowning just off of shore. For a time, it was also used to hospitalize and isolate lepers, and anyone who died on the island was cremated and scattered like the others. The thousands of deaths and cremations most likely have a lot to do with the hauntings that exist on the island, but it doesn't stop there. Apparently, the local government converted the old plague hospital into an asylum in 1922. Because that makes a ton of sense, right? Send yeah. the mentally ill to a horrific plague hospital right. to and, recover. And like, what what better way to secure a haunted island than, okay, one, we had a bunch of plague victims that we burned. And now we're, yeah, let's open it up in insane asylum. It's, a, it's like a double. Great logic there. Yeah. Seems like they should just close it off and make it a memorial at this point. Honestly. Oh my God. Under municipal archives, it operated or was disguised as a retirement home for long-term patients. Imagine being sent to that retirement home. Some of the furniture that still exists today suggests that the building operated as an asylum because there's still beds and all sorts of stuff that asylums have. And one of the signs still reads, Reparto Psychiatria, which translates to Psychiatry Department. Quickly after the asylum operations began, rumors of mistreatment and torture also began to spread. Because asylums were no place to get help. Right. They were a place to torture you till you were too far gone. I mean, in the 1900s, we know that yeah. we didn't treat psychiatry and mental illness. Like mental with, health? No, you just got the devil in you. Yeah, exactly. You know? that, or it was just like, get out of my sight, basically. Yeah. Hide like, you away from just, the rest of society. Yeah, it was basically a prison. Yes. So looking back, we can see a lot of the treatment that they did it was torture. And uh, there's an endless amount of horror stories that come from asylums, as we know, especially in the late 19th century, even the early 20th century, especially here in the U.S., we just have countless horror stories. We locked up adults for things like practicing a different religion that was outside of the norm. We even once locked up a young boy for because his mother said he was playing too much. What? Things, things like that. In an uh, asylum for that? Yeah. It was just a way to just get rid of problematic family members that for X, Y, and Z reasons you just didn't want to see anymore. And yeah, anything outside of the norm, quote unquote norm, is any odd, rebellious, neurodivergent behavior was just like, you're out of here. Some people never saw their families again, too. That was it. It was just a life imprisonment that you were sentenced essentially by your family. That's so fucked. My God. And then they were, and then you were basically treated like prisoners in a lot of these places. They crammed patients into overcrowded rooms. Uh, many couldn't sleep at night because people were constantly screaming. So I mean, it's it's like one of those things. If you weren't crazy before going into the place, this it's place made you crazy. Turn you crazy. Yeah. yeah. So when they gave these patients their quote unquote treatment, they were mostly just experiments to try and figure out what they should do. Some patients were spun on wheels like a carnival ride. I don't know any carnival or, ride that spins you on a wheel. <laughs> yeah, true. The only thing I can think of is the like the teacups the ones, spinning like around. The oh, gravity like the whirling ones. Yeah, yeah like yeah. those sideways, I guess, but not. not I'm like imagining this. somebody like strapped. <laughs> yeah, to no, a, I like, think that's what it was. That's a medieval yeah. like it's, torture device. I think like, it's to like spin you around. It's like one of the things where you throw knives. Yeah, like the yeah. magician throw right. knives. That's maybe what oh it my was. God. Yeah. What they what they think that was gonna do? Who knows? Oh, like scramble everything back into place. Yeah, right displace some blood or something i have no idea others were strapped to swings or branded with hot irons to try and quote bring them to their senses so yeah let's just hurt people until they snap out of it i guess is what they were thinking who are these sick demented individuals that worked I, I in wonder, these asylums i guarantee like, you they were just sadistic people trying to get in to it was work like at a these serial places. killer's heaven right like to go and torture people legally is, yeah you know have unlimited victims like and then it's to think about like in the later decades, they were giving people lobotomies, which Dude. are completely oh, yeah. insane. Uh, even scares me. Shock therapy that. is still a little bit controversial, but I know it's kind of like coming back, but to a, in a different, different way. Though, it's yeah, not like, it's let not, me electrocute you. Yeah, like put you in the electric chair and see. And bite on this piece of wood. Yeah. Because I know now it's like, you know, they use like electro, you know, the little electrode patches. Yep. So they can like target specific areas of the brain. And obviously right. it's like low, low yep. um, frequencies that they're using. But yeah. like back then, they're like, oh, just, that didn't work. Turn it up. Crank it up. Know? It was just abusive back then. I know I would really like to know who these people were running these asylums because I can't imagine anybody that worked at these places had a good heart. 
how could you be a good person working Seeing in a place this, that is just yeah. torturing humans and children day in day out screaming meanwhile you're you gotta know you're not helping right like there's no way they're like oh i'm i'm doing doing good work here we should try and find people. somebody maybe we could do a biography episode on someone who ran yeah one anybody out there have suggestions let us know because yeah. I'm, I'm curious about that Support for Lights Out is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Their products are precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package, the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 8 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code LIGHTSOUT at manscaped.com. As a man, we've probably all had an experience where you know maybe we're trimming trimming the hair down there and oopsie daisy i brought my shaver my trimmer too close to the skin and then before you know you got a nice old cut there nothing's more painful and so i was like you know what screw this i'm trying manscaped's new lawnmower 4.0 trimmer this guy nick proof i absolutely love this tool what's great about it too is it's waterproof you can take it into the shower which is nice Hell yeah. so no more like trying to like dangle your shit over the toilet so inside this performance package 4.0 which manscape was kind enough to send includes the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer not only that they give you a nose hair trimmer which i was very excited about because as i'm getting older you know I'm starting to get those uh, few stray nose hairs and these things are sleek man i mean listen that buzz oh yeah the weed whacker is what they call this one ear and nose hair trimmer plus they've got the crop preserver ball deodorant which i mean fresh lord knows i need that too <laughs> josh can tell we when know, i don't we know when austin doesn't use it because it's just there's a weird stank coming from <laughs> over there and what's great is they also give you the crop reviver which is called ball toner this is great just for like on the go you know if you're just out you just keep this maybe in your your car and you know a couple sprays good to go so it's time to take care of yourself or your loved one by going to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping with code lights out. Get 20% off and free shipping people with code lights out at manscaped.com. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the damn job with Manscaped. But Pavelia definitely had its uh, run with a sadistic doctor, that's for sure. Because at Pavalia, none of the patients were expected to be cured. It was used as a place for people to lock up their family members until death. Once they were placed in the asylum's care, rehabilitation was almost impossible. According to legend, many patients here describe seeing strange shadow creatures lurking in the isolated rooms. Many believe these were the ghosts of those who died during the plague. But it might just be <sighs> the evil entities that they're unleashing on people here. My god. Other patients would be kept up at night by the constant screaming, but many were convinced the screaming wasn't from the other patients. It was just the wailing of all the suffering spirits there. As patients complained to nurses and doctors about the shadow figures and night screaming, no one believed their stories. This was now justification to put the patients through harsher treatment, like, oh, you're seeing stuff now? <laughs> we'll fix that. Because to the medical staff, the shadow figures and the screaming were signs of a hallucination caused by an illness. You know, no... No regard for even the history there and like what could actually be on there. Like, oh, you just must be crazy. You're just seeing stuff. What's wrong right. with you? And it's believed that one sadistic doctor named Paolo always carried out the most radical experiments and treatments, so he said. But he did them for fun. And his abuse and torture went unchecked for decades. Healing the patient was rarely the goal, if ever. He would lure victims to isolated parts of the asylum and then torture them and the torture would get so brutal it often killed his patients. He would perform lobotomies when they weren't needed and removed limbs just for the fun of it. Obviously, no healing rehabilitation behind that move. I don't even know what his justification for that could have possibly been to like, oh, you're suffering from a mental illness. Let's take off an arm here. Yeah, that'll How fix it. That'll put things back into place. And occasionally he even poisoned his victims with experimental chemicals. During the physical operations, he used hammers, chisels, and hand drills without any anesthesia. Brutal. 
He performed so many unethical experiments that the ghosts of his victims began tormenting him as they should. And they even terrorized him to the point where he began to lose his own mind. And he realized, just like his patients, he was also now seeing the shadow figures and was hearing the screams in the night. Fearing that he would become a patient himself, he went to the top of the old church bell tower and threw himself off. One legend suggests that he didn't actually die from his fall. Onlookers watched as a strange fog rolled toward his dying body and surrounded him. In one gust of wind, the fog moved toward his throat and choked him to death. Later, some claimed he didn't jump out of the tower and that he was possibly pushed by a patient or some type of entity. Today, it's believed that the ghost of Dr. Paolo now haunts the island and the church bell can still be heard from the tower on the anniversary of his death even though it was removed decades ago. And if that's legit, that's creepy. Imagine hearing a bell going off and there's no bell there. No, thank you. The asylum was later permanently shut down in 1969. Took a while, right? Took a long while. And once again, the island was left abandoned and the old structures were left to rot. In the years since it was abandoned, the island changed ownership hands many times. Potential buyers plan to renovate the old buildings or make a resort. I don't know who's the paying good earn, hard earned money to go over, have a vacation on Pavelia. Sounds like a terrible idea. I mean, my God. One family wanted to purchase the island to build an isolated vacation home. I'm sure that would have lasted real long. <laughs> so they decided, you know, let's spend the night out there to scope it out. And they brought their teenage daughter along. At some point late in the night, the temperature dropped to freezing and a shriek came from their daughter's tent. When they ran to see what happened, they saw a massive gash through their daughter's face. They rushed her to the hospital where she got 14 stitches, but they never figured out what actually slashed her in the night. But after this, the family never stepped foot on the island again. Years pass and potential buyers were usually scared off, and if they ever did buy it, they never did anything with it. But many were still curious about the hauntings. In the last few decades, the island has drawn the attention of paranormal researchers from across the world. In 2009, one of our uh, major faves here, the Ghost Adventure Squad, dedicated an episode to the island. At night, they heard screams, voices, and wails of pain. Researchers have also detected an odd electromagnetic field toward the center of the island, even though there is no source of electricity. Others noticed that batteries would drain twice as fast and some researchers called out into the night claiming they were plague doctors to try and rile up the spirits. Soon after, they witnessed a tripod being knocked over by a phantom. For years, it was forbidden to step foot on the island without permission from the local government. In 2014, the Italian government offered a 99-year lease on the island to anyone who wanted to improve it. The island was finally auctioned off for 513,000 euros by an Italian businessman named Luigi. Brunyaro. Luigi, of course. Yeah. He outbid the Pavali Association, a local organization that wanted to keep the island free from commercial development, as it should be. And it's not clear what Luigi's plan for the island is. Maybe build a mansion. You never know. It was estimated that a total renovation of the buildings would cost 16 to 25 million euros. As you can imagine, I can't. <laughs> Excavating that place oh, would be a nightmare. God. You know? And nine years after the purchase, its old building still sat there, withering away. Now private businesses run tourist boats to and from the island. A ticket costs between 150 and 250 euros. They usually allow people to walk around for a few hours before returning. But some have traveled to the island with their own boats and even stayed overnight. Brave souls. Many who have visited sense negative energy during their visit and leave immediately. But curious paranormal investigators push their luck. In 2014, two Australian journalists plan to visit the island and stay overnight and they waited in a Venetian bar before the scheduled boat ride. One of the local cold meats delivery men, Giovanni, overheard their plan and he said, hey, I don't think you guys want to do that. You might want to rethink staying overnight on that island. After walking over to their table, Giovanni took a seat and lit up a cigarette. And what did he say? He said, watch out for Paolo. Remember, he was, that's the name of the doctor, The sadistic right? doctor, man. He is the bad one. He was a doctor there. He will cause you troubles. I know them all. Paolo, Marco, Giorno. Giorno is okay. He's a friendly phantasma. My father would take me fishing there as a boy, and when I was older, I stayed there myself for 15 nights straight. When I came back, I told everyone what happened to me. 
the ghosts and what they did. Paolo's ghost, mostly. He would push me, whoosh, whoosh, always pushing and things moving. Damn. So it sounds like uh, Paolo's the, Paolo's the evil still one out there. pissed off over there. Also, 15 nights. That's that's a long time to stay yeah, there. Two weeks, man. Like, right. I'm pack- sure, I'm sure if that's true, I'm sure he experienced some stuff over there for sure. sure. Like, God. Because he told the journalist that everyone thought he was a crazy one. But if the journalists were going to the island willingly, then they were the crazy ones. Then he went back to the bar. Later that day, the journalists boarded a small boat and made their way over to Pavalia. The buildings were all run down and cracks lined the walls. And the rubble from the failing masonry and bricks covered the interior floors. After the sun went down, the island went cold. They ventured through the empty, dilapidated buildings that were once busy with plague or asylum patients. Vines grew through the walls. Occasionally, some rooms still had furniture or broken pieces of furniture. There were lying claws from old cast iron tubs, hospital beds with stained mattresses, gurneys, steel bedside tables, and surgical instrument benches. A hospital bed had somehow made it into the small chapel, which isn't creepy at all. Some of the buildings still had intact religious frescoes painted on the ceilings. Partition curtains still hung between hospital beds, and old scaffolding still held up the exterior walls. Pigeons and rabbits infested the buildings. Lizards and millipedes crawled through the brush outside. Somewhere along the grounds, they finally stumbled on a chiseled stone rock that translated to, Do not dig. There are contagious bodies here. Signed 1793. Inside some rooms, they noticed it was hard to breathe. They claimed it was from mold and mildew. Some rooms even had trees growing through the floors. The old kitchen was filled with asbestos sheeting, broken ovens, and giant mixing vats. By sunrise, though, they hadn't experienced anything paranormal. Or that's what they thought at first. When they got back to the mainland and checked their pictures, they noticed something was off. Apparently, the misplaced steel hospital bed was against the right wall on their first visit to the small chapel. When they returned a couple of hours later and took another picture, the hospital bed had somehow moved to the far left wall. Their experience was way more tame than others who have visited. Over the past decade, screams, moans, and even laughter have been heard from abandoned buildings, especially at night. A common scream that many have heard comes from a little girl crying out for her parents. It's believed she is a spirit of a plague victim who had been taken by authorities and quarantined on the island until she died. Some have also reported seeing ghostly white figures dashing around the nearby gardens, mostly at night. Others have witnessed blurry lights as the temperatures drop to freezing. During the day, Provelia Island is surrounded by noisy boats and birds, and the clear sunny skies make it seem not so scary from a distance. Some have even described the island as a place of peace and serenity. I'd love to talk to those people about that. But after sundown, it becomes dark, quiet, and isolated. The silence amplifies each creak and moan of the old buildings. Visitors question every movement they see. The scampering critter might actually be a ghost or the change in air pressure might cause a door to close. But then night takes over and rational explanations become shrouded in confusion. If you try to sleep through the night, all I gotta say is good luck. There's a constant presence in the night air that's hard to explain. And you're at the mercy of the island. There are no lights except for your own. And most of the time, there's nobody else on the island but you. Even if you don't encounter any ghosts, some visitors have experienced detailed visions of their own deaths. And by morning, their mental status is forever changed. Others believe that a sense of evil has clung to them long after they leave. Whatever evil energy lies within the island has seeped into their bones. If a skeptic stays a full night on the island, many believe that the abandoned hospital is enough to make them believe that something paranormal exists in Pavalia even if it's not in the form of a ghost. It's strange to think that only three miles across the water, you got Venice, which I mean, it's a huge tourist hub. It's rich in history and beautiful architecture, but Pavalia Island is the opposite. No matter how many times it changes ownership with the chance of being renovated and improved, it might always be known for its horrific past and its hauntings that have lasted hundreds of years. And you'll always be reminded by the fact that the island's victims make up half of the soil beneath your feet. Today's episode is also sponsored by HelloFresh. We talk a lot about HelloFresh here in Every Plate, it's owned by the same company, and we are all fans of HelloFresh. 
Personally, my favorite one is the sweet chili pork and cabbage stir fry. I don't know. What about you, Josh? Show you ramen, man. That's Ooh. like my one of my favorites. It comes around like every month or so. That's what's great about HelloFresh is that not only do they bring like fresh and new recipes, but a lot of the, you know, customer favorites they bring back. Fall is right around the corner and HelloFresh is really here to help you plan out your busy season. Like me, I don't always have time to cook but HelloFresh makes it really easy and they're super tasty dishes that are straight to your door, super convenient. Does it seem like your family is, you know, just hungry all the time? Oh yeah. I mean, that's how I am. I am hungry literally from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. Luckily with HelloFresh, you can add snacks, sides and more to your weekly HelloFresh order, which is awesome. Just simply shop HelloFresh Market. Yeah, I love that they did this because you know, as we head into the holiday season and everything, the grocery store is really the last place you want to be. So true. It just gets crazy over there and the lines and, you know, stuff's out of stock and all that kind of thing. So HelloFresh really makes it super easy. Plus, you save money. It's 25% cheaper than takeout and less expensive than grocery shopping. Because whenever I like, it's up to me to go like plan the meal and stuff. I usually make it pretty unhealthy just because I want it to taste good. But HelloFresh still tastes good but saves me so much time and money. So thank you to HelloFresh for being a loyal sponsor to the show. So go to hellofresh.com slash 50 lights out and use code 50, that's 50 lights out for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, go to hellofresh.com slash 50 lights out and use code 50 lights out for 50% off plus free shipping. Check out America's number one meal kit today. With that being said, this island should be absolutely turned into like a memorial yeah. for these poor people that were all sent there Agreed. to die. Agreed. I don't get what these people trying to turn it into like a another tourist destination or something, but it seems like it should be a memorial. Or and it seems dangerous too to have like remains from the Black Plague potentially be dug up. And, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's an issue or not, but I imagine it's probably not good. Yeah. To, I mean, I, dig around I on there it's like even with this island okay they burned all the bodies to make sure that it, the plague doesn't come back in any way i think that was the idea plus they just had so much, many of them but they did come across that stone where it's like don't dig here there are bodies so i wonder if they also had buried physical bodies at certain points as well so it might be human ash on top as well as physical bodies beneath the surface well and i wonder too like I know that in order to actually reduce human bones to, to ash, the temperature has got to be really high. extremely, I want to say it's like 1200 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. It could be wrong, but it's somewhere in that range. So it's not like they were, they had like incinerators, you know, modern incinerators where they can right. measure the temperature. They're just like burn fire basically. Yeah. So my guess is that there likely is tons of human bones and remains beyond just ash For that's sure. that's under underground there so i mean if you were to go and actually try to like well first of all you'd have to like bulldoze the whole island get rid of all of the historical i mean just just the cleanup of that place would be not only dangerous but it would just be super super expensive to to try and like build something on top of that because like i i can see them doing something like oh you know we have this resort you know i'm sure in developers minds are like oh this would be a great you know Vacation kind of a selling area. point too it's yeah. got a haunted history right you know like the stanley hotel which i mean it doesn't have this tragic or dark of a history to it but i'm sure people would line up to to go stay on this island for sure you know if you could potentially steep, experience steep costs to renovate though they were saying it's like millions of dollars you know so i don't even know so you gotta trek everything three miles across the lagoon true yeah so what do you what do you think as far as this haunting goes like what what kind of haunting do you think this is and you know we've talked a number of times throughout our paranormal episodes about different types of hauntings and entities and things like that and there's obviously a few different kinds you've always got the possibility of inhuman entities and this could be you know spring from a number of different places whether it's a living person or animal or you know something more supernatural whether it's demonic or shadow people or something like that and to me, I think that's probably least likely that this is something like demonic that existed there prior to these events happening. Yeah, agreed. Right. Like yeah. 
as far as we know, I mean, we're going back to the what 14th century, so it's pretty far back um, in history. So I would be surprised to find out if there was like even more dark things that happened there or some type of i do wonder if there's some mythological lore there like going the way back going way back like we're talking like ancient roman empire times yeah if there's something like that there but it seems like that's not the case that this was just an island that you know was off the coast it was mostly untouched i think before the refugees landed there yeah i'm i'm definitely more on board i know like residual hauntings um i think i'm more on board with that echoes of the past and echoes of people and imprints of people's there. energy here i mean it's it seems to me that that is most likely what's going on is like there's just i mean there's so much suffering and sadness that happened on this island i mean you got to remember all the people that were still alive going over there to then die and all the people that were already dead that were sent there i mean i can only imagine that much of the paranormal activity stems from just that residual um imprint of of all the people who you know that was their their last place on this earth um before before passing so i always make- find it interesting though when some some of them have names like paolo that, that's yeah. like a well-known guy that's there i wonder i don't know it sounds like um as far as actual interactions with him go they're kind of rare but at least as far as the local stories and stuff like they're like yeah no he was a real dude and yeah i mean with that makes like it'd be definitely a, a mixture of different things i mean so many things happen that there's absolutely a possibility for intelligent haunting or ghosts that interact with you it sounds like that's a definitely a thing that goes on there so um but i'd say like this the main source is definitely a residual um imprint of of the loss you know the souls that that died there for sure daniel what are your thoughts on on this island i mean it definitely has a tragic history um again i'm the skeptic in this situation so i'm not totally on board with it being a haunted island i think a lot of the times when there are these haunted histor- historical sites it's the documented reality that people always have in the back of their mind when they're sure. going around these places and they are they're constantly thinking about that and i think that can maybe trick their brains in some scenarios. Obviously there's stories here that I can't explain like the woman getting slashed in the face. That's crazy. Um, I know skeptics always have their minds changed when going to, when going to this place. So I would love to go. Uh, I probably wouldn't sleep in the hospital due to the asbestos, but (laughs) yeah, (laughs) right. No, thanks. Um, Yeah. More physical, real natural terrors (laughs) going on there. But I, I do think that, like I said about Lake Lanier, I, I do think that there was to be a haunted place on this planet. This would make a lot of sense. This place with countless human victims and centuries of suffering and torture and abuse with that much negativity in one place, it would make sense that this place would have yeah. something lasting that is beyond our comprehension. Yeah. So you kind of side with more of like the, the more scientific explanation behind perceived hauntings is, is that it's really like you're, the the subconscious of your mind is is melding with with the reality of the history there and the two are kind of fusing together and therefore potentially a lot of the things that people experience are are potentially not actually happening in reality but more so in the mind because i mean i mean we all know that your mind can play tricks on you it, it happens to me all the time and i'm like stop yeah I'm like please yeah. stop like you know especially please, you're like and, and, and in, your yeah. environment plays a, a lot into that right yeah. like if it's dark and creepy and everything yeah. you know, looks haunted around you and yeah can, your brain's gonna yeah. go to a haunted place yeah, it can aff- affect your emotional state because it's like even when my cousin went i haven't had the chance but my cousin went to auschwitz and it's like oh yeah, yeah those buildings haven't operated you know for years and they've just been empty and you go take tours but he just the emotional presence and the, how sobering it is, it kind of just affects you knowing what happened there. So I wonder if that's kind of in the same line as this uh, island that, like what Danny was saying, just knowing the history of the things, the horrific things that have happened there leaves this emotional impression on you just just by the fact that you're walking on human ash. You know, I think you're more prone or maybe susceptible to the paranormal yeah, or experiencing yeah, a, something like that yeah that's a really good good point because i think a lot of it too is 
is it's really dependent on the person too. Mm-hmm. Like depending on what you believe in in your beliefs around the paranormal, I think that affects the type of paranormal activity that you experience. Because again, in this this particular story, you have the journalists that go over there. They don't experience anything. They're like, mm-hmm. okay, I thought this place was haunted, but they took a bunch of pictures and stuff. And then they come back and then they review the pictures like, oh, wait, that bed was over there and then it moved over there. And it's stuff like that that happens. And that that type of activity, I feel like, happens far more often than somebody having screams heard in the night or like having a full apparition you know you're appear in front of you crazy or something asylum like that. doctor yeah yeah, like yeah exactly around, yeah. so i think i i think you have to look at it as like it's a spectrum uh, of of activity and depending on your belief in that spectrum i think affects the the actual activity that you may be suspe- susceptible to and like perhaps that you believe in something so far and so deep that 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 sort of activity is what you experience as opposed to somebody who's more skeptical and is maybe like, yeah, ghosts don't necessarily believe in them, but like if one appeared in front of me, that'd be cool. Yeah. But then, you know, you all of a sudden realize after the fact that, oh, shit moved while I was there. That definitely won't. Like, what do you think about stuff moving like that? Like what, how would you explain that? Would I guess somebody could just like mix up photos they took or what direction they right. took. So it's hard to say like, how accurate that is but would that make you like if you were to go there you took pictures you came back and you're like i swear that was over there and now it's over here like what would your thoughts on that be i mean i would probably trust the photographs more than i would trust sure. my own memory because yeah. but if there were two photographs that depicted like if there was if there was two photographs depicting what bed on this side and a bed on the other side of the room i would be stumped i'm not gonna lie to you i would be stumped i wouldn't know why that happened uh it would definitely make me believe a little bit more but i would i would trust the pictures of my own brain yeah that's why i added that because i know it's so in- insignificant oh a hospital bed moving it's not the most compelling like hollywood story but i think it's sometimes the paranormal might be a very mundane thing and just the fact that something can move across a room yeah. as a skeptic i think that might be sometimes the most convincing things is the yeah. paranormal as a mundane situation that's there's nobody screaming there's nobody with a knife running around it's just like it's kind of a head scratcher well i always go back to the idea that perhaps the activity is unrelated to the people that died there at all and that's not even what's going on there in fact there's there's something like what if there is some other intelligence you know have it be you know call it aliens call it interdimensional beings call it something that is not perceived in our normal reality that exists you know cohabitates this planet with us and therefore i tend to believe that there is there's is some other type of malevolent intelligence that we've kind of coined the term uh over over human history of demons or um different types of entities and things like that poltergeist whatever you want to call them and there is something that exists in in this realm with us and and it is able to feed off of off of the consciousness or the the souls whatever you want to call it that has has been brought there there's just the sheer magnitude brought to this one location and i think the emotions have a lot to do with it because i i think just as love is the most powerful emotion a human can experience in my opinion i think anger sadness pain is the is the counter to that right and so you know think about how powerful love is and how it connects all of us i think pain and and sadness also connects us as well and i think there's other beings out there other intelligence out there that feed off of that that sort of energy i I think i think you could look at it from different perspectives like is it energy is it emotions is there something more to emotions that we don't understand that's more physical than we than we think of it in our everyday life and i think there's a possibility that there's something interdimensional going on here in this area that is somehow feeding off of it and feeding may not be the right word leeching off of it or something that it's it's almost using it as a way to whether it's learn about us or um it helps them in some way yeah um, it, which is very i'm going very out there right now no, that's but, right. It's, like but it's the, just a, it's just yes. an interesting different way to look at it and i don't think it's as simple as like this is demons from hell you know i don't think you have to go to 
you know the biblical stance of like heaven and hell i think it could be something completely unexplained to us unknown to us at this point in time but it's something that exists there with us yeah and i i I like that idea at least from the standpoint of like i think demons and hell and heaven and and it's just names we made up and i think think that's kind of the old school paranormal approach it's like it's always biblical tied back to to that so i like at least you're bringing a new approach to the paranormal i had a thought it's kind of it's not like what you're saying but just a parallel theory that it yeah if you're on board with like the the simulation theory okay yeah what if it was just like they walked in the room the hospital bed was on one side they left came back later whoever was running the program forgot to put the hospital bed in the right spot they're like fuck (laughs) dave you're fired you forgot to put the damn hospital gurney back we were were, yeah they were they were fucking with the journalists like man we'll see see how good they are at investigating yeah yeah you know we'll move back over here i mean that's that's another scenario for sure i mean a simulation theory don't even get me started on that but. i guess to connect the dots with that would be if someone's running the matrix then maybe it is a different intelligent life form right well and that's where it leads you to is like the simulation theory could but then who's running the simulation <laughs> before, <laughs> right? before we get into the simulation theory <laughs> <laughs> thank god thank um, god <laughs> josh what you were kind of describing reminds me a lot of uh pennywise from it yeah, uh, that's, a, the that's a great dimensional being it. that feeds off of the negative energy of yes. humans. I, I think that's and kind it, of a great parallel. Isn't in the lore? I think it is a an alien. It is, isn't that officially in the? It's lore? an interdimensional yeah. alien. Yeah, that's exact. And I think Stephen King's on the right track when he when he came up with that yeah. that character. Is that's like a a very like physical representation of of the series I'm talking about. But it's, it's like you know in a, in a creepy way that you know because we all relate to clowns we're all scared of clowns so it's like of course this interdimensional alien that feeds off of um you know fear and and children that you know it's going to be represented as a as a clown and i think that's yeah. kind of the way that the paranormal really works is that it's it comes to you in the ways that you you interact with it in the ways that you know yeah. versus and obviously sometimes people see things that they don't know what it is they don't they don't have an explanation for it, but most of the times you find that these whatever this other intelligence is is coming to you in a way that your brain can compute it like if you think about chris bledsoe Mm -hmm. you know heavily religious you know um very very knowledgeable in the bible and and eventually it starts out as orbs then eventually scales up to full angelic beings and people you know those who believe in angels and demons and stuff like that they're like well that's what it is it's an angel it's a demon well, it's like okay it could be sure it could be if that's w- what's really going on but i think it's far more complex than i think it's appearing to him as a, as an angel but that's because it knows that that's what he that's all he can perceive right it's, he can't perceive them in their natural in whatever this intelligence is in its natural form we're not able, so that's why they appear to us in these different forms whether it's orbs or these flying craft that we perceive as ufos or flying saucers and stuff perhaps and there's a theory that some of these craft in itself are are bio, biological like that's not there's not like a little alien sitting behind the, the steering wheel piloting the ship the ship itself is the it's biological like nope yeah exactly yeah. yeah exactly or um for example the the navy commander fravor and ryan graves they're like it's a sphere with a cube inside and there's and it's not big enough for anything to to sit inside of it like that we know of even a small little gray alien three foot tall wouldn't be able to fit in one so it's like what is the sphere with the cube in it well that could be the intelligence itself like that's that's it's that's how it morphs itself into a physical manifestation in our atmosphere our reality our and that's why it's able to in and out of of our vision and that's also why it's so hard to capture it on camera and i think that's what i'm really starting to as i go farther down this road is like we're always so tri- skeptics are always so tripped up. how come we can't capture anything on camera how come we can't record it how come we can't get 4k vi- it's like because it knows how to man- it knows how to manipulate that and we don't have the the lens to capture everything in the universe True, you yeah. know what i mean like we just figured out how to get a telescope out there to like you know take pictures of deep space and things like that there's tons of things we don't know about the the very dimensions that we live in like yeah, we, we only could, know how to operate within in. these we're in the bronze age compared yeah, to yeah. somebody else and that's that's what I, I that's what frustrates me about people is like they're always like oh there would be way more evidence there'd be way more pictures and 
you know, not saying that's you, Daniel, but uh, you piece yeah. of shit. No, Daniel. but I, I, get, I get it from a rational human perspective. We want to see physical, tangible proof. We want to like, and I, I'm especially for me, I'm same this, way, yeah. same way. I'm like, I won't be able to fully hundred percent believe until I have a experience myself and i with my own eyes my own consciousness i i somehow make contact with whatever this is or right. or experience this paranormal uh intelligence or activity or whatever it may be like weird things happen and and i always wonder i'm like i go back to that scene from interstellar where he pushes the book off the shelf i'm like when weird little things happen like that you it makes you wonder is there somebody or something from an, in another dimension that's viewing what we're doing moving things and making things happen and you know that can also lead to the simulation theory it's all it's all just yeah, fucking yeah. crazy i mean yeah you can just go nuts with it but it's definitely more out there to tie back to italy i think you were saying that the world's first uh crash of a ufo yeah was that's what's really interesting in italy. yeah yeah that's that's wild news so this has been something that's been suppressed by the italian government for years and years and years but it's it's and there's there's actual documents that have been um brought forward by this italian researcher who you know in recent news with you know all of the ufo hearings and everything is it's come to light that there was a crash in lombardy italy i believe it was 14 years prior to roswell which i think it was like 1933 and roswell's 47 and something crashed there and was recovered and it was a very very uh big event that's i believe highly credible i mean there's there's significant documentation on this it's just been been suppressed so it's like there's that and then there's also um i forget who i was i was listening to but it was somebody uh pretty credible within the the ufo community who was talking about that there's been significant reports about ufos being seen off the coast of italy coming out of the water and that there's I'm trying to remember where it is there's like one area um i can't remember if it's on the west side of italy or the east side of Italy, but there's an area that's like a hotspot for UFO activity where literally you can go out there and you can just see these like orbs coming out of the coming out of the ocean, going back into the ocean and stuff. And so the the whole idea that these whatever these things are are able to to fly at speeds beyond anything we've ever seen before, stop on a dime, do things that defy gravity, defy all technology that we know of on this planet, and then What's interesting too is that we've tried to create craft because you would think like what a great weapon or some sort of surveillance technology to be able to like fly through there at high rates of speed dive into the ocean like imagine if there's flying submarines like you had a submarine that could fly at high rates of speed like a jet dive into the ocean come out like that'd be wild and actually i believe it was raytheon i think it was either, it was either raytheon or lockheed martin at one point tried to develop this technology tried to develop like a flying submarine type of thing but it literally there it just never came to fruition because it just it, it didn't seem possible like how would you do that how would you create something that's submersible and you know heavy and can go to great depths of the ocean and also fly at high rates of speed i mean that'd be such a heavy object right so when you think about that and we have like tons of footage i mean we have the footage that was released by by the pentagon of this thing is flying at flying high drops down and straight down to the surface of the ocean and then it dives down into the ocean disappears and pilots see this all the time military pilots especially and you're like they what have, is going on they have this tech why have they not enslaved us yet they're not they're not they're not here to i don't i don't believe it's enslavement that they want well wouldn't they be able to see humans and like you're single-handedly destroying this planet i think that's what they're concerned about i think they're trying to i think it's trying to figure out Perhaps, and this is the thing too, is I don't know that they necessarily know how to interface with us or, or, you know, you could go even deeper down the conspiracy rabbit hole and you'd be like, there's already like, there's certain groups on this planet that have sort of like confirmed agreements with whatever this is. And there's a reason why they don't just come out and be like, this is what we are. And I think it's more so an issue of like, they haven't quite figured out how to interface with us in a way that would not send us all let's say they don't want to interface with us at all why wouldn't they mitigate the problem in some other way like i don't know obviously with this is all hypothetical but like why wouldn't they just release a chemical agent and start killing 
Well, I go back to this idea that there's like universal laws in the universe. Like the universe has its own. So they have like a G Geneva Convention. Yeah, of, that there's something along those lines of like interference among amongst among species, among different dimensional beings. I think that there's, or perhaps if they do try to affect, because it's like it seems like they haven't quite figured out how to, or maybe they do know how to, they just don't. But they they are many cases seemingly moving in and out of dimensions like they're they're disappearing into space and you know they're here one second gone the next and it's like maybe they're not able to stay within our reality our dimension for extended periods of time for i mean it could be an infinite number of reasons i mean perhaps it affects our it could affect us in a negative way or it could affect us in a positive way that goes against some sort of universal law like there's this idea of of all you know the, i forget what the actual hypothesis is um maybe it's called the zoo hypothesis or something like that where it's all civilizations across the universe how are on their own when it comes to development and evolution and so we just have to we get can't there be impacted at our own pace yeah i think that's part of it and i think the other part too is that they are looking out for us in 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 many cases because i mean we have confirmed reports of of full-on nuclear reactors being shut down missile silos being shut down uh, and we have pictures of this like there's a lot more evidence that a lot of people just don't know about and and they've been completely disarmed so they clearly don't like the fact that there's nuclear weapons on this planet i mean in every single battle across history there has been reports of ufos being seen and this is like confirmed across the board i mean maybe not every single one we have recorded um, but testimony from people there saying we saw these things. I mean, there's a there's a UFO video that Jeremy Corbell posted of um, this orb over uh, Mosul, um, and you know we were doing military operations over there, and there's this orb, this like uh, spherical object that's just flying over the top, and it's being caught on military uh, radar and cameras, and this thing's just gliding over, almost like just surveying, just observing, not a, not doing anything but it's very interesting to me because it's like clearly something is keeping tabs on what's going on here and for me that gives me some hope of like whatever is here may not let it get as bad as many of us think it could get you know get to like, like a lot a of us have of safety now yeah almost. like and because i think they are invested in this planet as much as we are we need this planet to survive they do as well they're tied to it as well and perhaps there's something deeper spiritually consciousness related. i mean there could be something completely far more complicated than we even understand that they are protecting that they are they have a vested interest in in the survive survivability of of the planet and us as a species like or they are a you know then you could go to the oh god i'm just going on crazy tangent right now i just realized but would have never seen the uh pavalia episode <laughs> yeah i know right <laughs> part two we're now getting yeah. into alien <laughs> theories here so an even more i don't know kind of out there theory but there's there's actually a, a lot of interesting i don't know what you call it truth nuggets if you want but if you've ever looked at the uh, the books of Enoch and you talk, look at the Anunnaki and you look at some of the, you know, ancient Egyptians history and their knowledge and what they knew about, you know, and get into Hermes and Thoth and some of these, what a lot of people would call legends and stories. But I tend to think that there's definitely truth within all of, of, of the stories of over past. And if you uh, watched a, our episode with Graham Hancock over on mile higher, he's a strong proponent of this of there perhaps was some form of lost civilization that existed before the last ice age that was wiped out and perhaps their their intelligence and their civilization was just at a much higher higher level than we were we are now and in different ways perhaps maybe it's not in the same way technologically where you know they've got microchips and computers and cell phones but more advance in a, in a spiritual um consciousness way like they're just higher elevated beings where they're more connected in tune with the universe with the frequencies and with light and all these different elements that we have seemingly lost our connection with as human beings and and throughout our history have attempted to explain it through religions and through you know all these different different ways to try to make sense make it make sense to us you know through stories and things like that but they were 
deeply connected on a whole different level and perhaps whatever this intelligence is is some either offshoot of this lost civilization or perhaps they are the the creators of life here on earth in itself like have you ever thought that the creators of all of us and all life on earth is still here and it's here observing and it's just in a different form that we can't they got some explaining to do if that's the case i want to talk to the manager over there so i mean i could go on and on and on and you know maybe this will be bonus content for the members (laughs) over at on youtube but but yeah we'll we'll, let's go ahead and wrap today because i'll just keep going and you know (laughs) sure some of you are like all right josh like Settle down there, buddy. I, I wish I was half as versed as you are in the UFO realm. I've been, I, am I just am so, I think I've been on this mission, especially since I kind of deconstructed from Christianity to try to like figure out what the, what's really going on here. And, you know, I still hold on to some of those, those concepts and things. And I know a lot of you out there are, are, are religious and, you know, believe in the Bible and heaven and hell and angels and demons. And I, I respect, I respect people that do. And I think everybody's entitled to their own beliefs and i think there's truth in in everything i think there's truth in all religions and and there's good things to to derive from them and there's obviously bad things that come out of it as well but i think we can all agree religious or not that we don't know shit i can agree we don't know anything like i i'm spewing all sorts of stuff and it's just you know shared ideas from other people and other and ancient texts and things like that and you know, I hold on to some of them as potentially truth, but at the end of the day, I don't know anything. I mean, I'm just, I'm just like you. I'm we're, just trying to figure it out. Yeah, we're day here by to day. learn, right? We're just yeah. here to learn, trying to trying to make our way through this wild universe, flying around on. I mean, just think about the fact we're just holding ourselves to this <laughs> space rock, flying through yeah. outer space. You know, I try not to think about it too much, though, because then it gets a little <laughs> <Yeah>. scary. <laughs> you know, we could just get wiped out by an asteroid at any time, yeah. and it all be, you know, so it's just. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to think about. I think it's good to expand your mind, expand your your uh, your views on things, and just realize that it could just be way more complicated than we can ever even imagine. And I think that's yeah. the root of it is we don't know because it's our brains just can't like we can comprehend. I'm, uh, it's impressive what we can comprehend. Yeah, but we're still just monkey men in the end of the day. Right? We're still very primal. Got we're my still very brain primitive. I can't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're still just trying to figure out how to. How to walk across the street without getting hit by some <laughs> Yahoo, you know, or you know, it's just we're still dealing with very simple primitive problems. How we how we get our food on the table, how to make sure we got shelter at night, a bed to sleep in. And True. so it's like our, we're still very much just trying to like survive. We're in that survival mode still. And so Absolutely. you know, it's nice to sometimes not think about survival mode and think about like, well, is there something beyond that? Is there something greater than than this and this purpose here and that's where i go but i'll i'll, I'll step down from my my ted talk here and <laughs> we'll leave you guys with uh yeah let us know what your thoughts are on pavalia you think uh you believe that this is one of the most haunted locations in all of italy perhaps the world perhaps the most haunted island that exists definitely let us know we'd love for you to join us as a lights out low life there's a join button on the youtube dot com slash lights out podcast i believe is the link we'll put the links and everything for you if you're listening on spotify or apple Podcasts, come join us but until next time lights out everybody